Well, listen, this is good to be back again with my good friend, Robert Spencer. It's been a few months, hasn't it, Robert, since we've had you on the show here? Yes, it's good to talk to you again, Jay. <laughs> and it's been quite a week. And the reason I asked you to come on is because there has been a, a real pivotal interview that happened back on oh, a number of weeks ago. And what I wanted to do, I, I wanted to unpack this, not just what happened back on April 27th. That was when the interview happened in Saudi Arabia uh, on the what they call the Liwan al-Mudaifa show, which is put out by a guy named Abdullah al-Mudaifa. He is well known. He is very popular. It was broadcast and put onto the al Arabiya channel, which is the official channel for Saudi Arabia. So this is not incidental, and this is not insubstantial. Uh, what, and it was the interview with the Crown Prince, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who is de the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia today. Now, people might poo-poo that and say, okay, so he's the de facto ruler, but he controls the holy places. He controls both Mecca and Medina for the whole world, for the whole Muslim world. So when he speaks, you have to pay attention. And also for the fact that, that of what he's trying to do. And the, in the interview, it was about, a, oh, about an hour and a half long. And the first hour was just on what he wanted to do for this new project called the 2030 Project. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of this, Robert. This happened, was initiated in 2000. You've heard of it? Yes, I have. Okay. Initiated in 2015. And this is his... Uh, really his his masterpiece what he wants to do he wants to make saudi arabia the magnet for the whole world in many areas he wants to make it the technological magnet so he wants to take silicon valley and bring it to the gulf of aqaba uh, with that long line of industries that they are now building uh, that will have be the technological capital of the world he wants to take of course uh, he already has the petrochemicals, and so he's already there. He has the means to do so. But he wants to build all these huge skyscrapers all over Riyadh. He wants to make Riyadh the capital of the world. And with Mecca, of course, the capital of the Muslim world. And he also, with that huge clock tower that he's built there, the fourth highest building in the world, to make it the center of time. But what was fascinating is he also wants to make Saudi Arabia the educational capital of the world. And... If you're, if you're going to make it the educational capital, that means you're going to have to step into the 21st century, right? No doubt about it. There's so many technological advances. And also, of course, the Saudi society has been formulated in a way that's completely impractical in terms of the modern world, particularly in all the restrictions on women's activities and women's movement. And so he has to tackle that if this project is going to get anywhere beyond the planning stage. Well, right now it is the planning stage. What was fascinating to me as I was listening to this, I, he would. there are three major universities in Saudi Arabia that he referred to, and he's saying that they're in the top 500 in the world. He wants to bring them into the top 10. In other words, he wants them to compete with Cambridge and Harvard and Yale and Oxford and University of Pennsylvania, these kind of schools. And I just kind of shook my head and said, is, does he li is he really listening to himself? Because... Well, I mean, just take that, for instance, right there. What does that say to you? Well, I think that he really, he obviously means what he says. And I don't really think that that is as wild as it may seem at first glance. Because if you look at Oxford and Cambridge and the others that you enumerated, it's been a growing scandal how many millions of dollars they've taken from the Saudis, from UAE, from Qatar, and that has deformed Islamic studies in the United States to a tremendous degree. But I can see how it would be easily viewed by the Saudis as an ultimately poor investment and that it would have been better if they had invested in their own universities and made them the leading universities in the world. The quality of education being what it is in the West today, I don't really think that would be all that difficult. Well, this is exactly what he's planning to do, what you have just suggested. Maybe he listened to you. Whatever the reason, he would like to make all the great schools, the best schools in the world, to be his. And so he would like to crack that, that first hundred, then he'd like to crack the first ten. 
he would like to at least have two to three of his universities in the top 10. And I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm incredulous as I'm listening to this, but then the million dollar question comes. And this is the million dollar question that is put out by Abdullah al Mudaifa. And he, I, I don't know whether this was planned or he did it innocently. He asked, well, what about this extremism that we have here? What about the Wahhabi movement? What about the extremists who are standing against Western education, standing against, well, how are you going to deal with that situation? What are you going to do with all these traditions uh, that seem to s s uh, shut down much of what you would like to do? And you could see that he was nervous. He kept on doing this, this, you know, yeah, like he I had a that. I thought that was very strange. Like he was as well. emotionally, uh, he, he was, he was, there was something in what he was saying, like, you know, like you're doing that was catching in his throat. Like I thought, I he, thought this he was curious, like, with, his, with his with his dress. But what was fascinating, if you look at the rest of the interview, he hardly did that at all. He only yeah, started this doing made him very nervous and yes. nervous in in regard to his throat. Right. And I think isn't that interesting in light of what might happen? Okay, I'm not to, gonna I'm not gonna take that any further than that because we're not we're not in any way saying in any shape or form that this will happen to him. But it was obvious to me that he was nervous. And it was obvious yes. that he used that to to delay his response. Because every time he did that, he paused. It was like a um or a oh, like what we would do in English. And then he came out and said, and this was, was fascinating to me. He said, Well, we have the constitution, and the constitution is the Quran. So the Constitution is this book right here. As if that was a de facto, that would answer the question. However, then, of course, our good friend Wadaifa said, well, well, what about the Hadith? What about these many traditions? And he said, well, you know, as you well know, there are different gradations. Uh, and he just quickly named them off real quickly. Uh, Sahi, Hassan, Daif, those three real quickly. And he, he pretty much said anything that was Hassan or Taif pretty much dispense with, but that which is Sahih must agree with this, must agree with this. And then he went on to say that, and because then the question came out, well, what are the, what are, what are you going to do with the Wahhabis? Because the Wahhabis, as you well know, since the 1700 have been really the theological base for Saudi Arabia and with, for all the princes, which he represents, who are the political wing, the, the brotherhood, which is the Wahhabis, have pretty much given them their authority, their religious authority, their theological authority for 400 years. It was fascinating to see what he responded on that. And his response was this. He said, why are we allowing one man to be an arbitrary between God and us? You it was a wonderful it's... answer because it was a quintessentially Wahhabi answer. And yet he turned it against Wahhab. It, it was, was really marvelous, <laughs> you know? Uh, <coughs> Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in the late 18th century preached that uh, all the Islam had fallen into idolatry, essentially, and that it had to be cleansed of this idolatry by removing everything that did not come from the Quran and from the Prophet, as he saw it. And so Wahhab himself would applaud and say, yes, the, uh, the, the, the idea that I have created a school of thought is idolatrous in itself. Uh, but nobody has said this in Saudi Arabia up until MBS. And so it's it's really, I thought, now that's an extraordinarily clever thing. You got to give the man credit. that He's going to get a lot of pushback from the Wahhabi leaders. And he has the perfect argument to give against them. The Absolutely. one that they will not have any effective comeback to. That's right. Brilliant. It was a master stroke on his part. And I thought it was it was brilliantly done because that's the very thing. That's the very thing he's he is claiming this. He it was almost like he was saying Wahab uh, would would roll in his grave if he saw what you are doing with him and elevating him to such a status. This is what you don't do. This is Mushrikud. This is Mushrik. This is elevating someone else alongside God. So you so what was fascinating he then said so what is it it must be a continuous contextualization we must have inter basically what you're saying is we must have ijtihad for today there is not just one ijtihad that's the word for interpretation of scripture that is must be codified in the 1700s it must be continuous including today including today but what is that's that is that's a shiite argument and that's going to get him in trouble 
because according to Wahhabi is a Wahhabi Islam, according to Sunni Islam in general, the gate of Ijtihad closed with the death of Ahmad ibn Hanbal in 855 AD. And there has been no Ijtihad ever since then. It would be illegitimate because there was Ijma consensus on all the major questions and they were settled by all the, uh, the pioneers of Islamic jurisprudence, the ones who formulated it. And so there's nothing to discuss. It's only the application of what has been settled. And so for him to say, oh no, it's all up for grabs, that's, that's a very problematic part of what he said in terms of Sunni Islam, not just Wahhabi Islam, but Sunni and Islam. who is going to do the ijtihad now? He? Is That's he going to be the arbiter? The people who are the founders of the traditional schools of Islamic jurisprudence. And they all, like I say, Ahmad ibn Hanbal is the last one. The, the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali schools, and Hanbal died in 855. That's the end of that formulation of jurisprudence. What do you do with Muhammad Abdu, who in 1920s said that we must reopen ijtihad? And he gave a fatwa from Al-Azhar University there in Cairo. What would you do with that statement? Well, that's that's the kind of thing that he can point to. But that didn't get a whole lot of traction in the Islamic world. And there were many people who thought that Abdu had overstepped the boundaries in saying this and that he was going against what had been what was settled consensus. Okay, so he would be a representative of of, uh, of the, well, he would be representative of theologians for the 1920s. Now we have a crown prince who is not a theologian in what any sense of the term. In fact, he is despised by the theologians, not only shutting down, according to some of the articles that I've been reading, that if you take what he is saying and put it put it in practical terms, you're shutting down 90% of the, of the Hadith. And he's also oh, yeah. shutting down Wahhabism, two of them, in one interview. Now, he's shutting down two of the most the stringent areas that w Muslims are absolutely dependent on to know how to walk, talk, eat, drink, and sleep. Yeah, he's, it's, it's actually, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but what he said was ultimately completely incoherent and impractical. There is no <laughs> way that it could work. There is no way that it could happen. When you, you take, for example, the classifications of Hadith that you mentioned before, Sahih, Hassan, Taif, and he's going to get rid of Hassan and Taif, the, the, the weak ones, and stay with the reliable ones, the Sahih Hadith. Well, okay, look, I have a Sahih Hadith that I prepared for this program that uh, says in uh, Musnad Ahmad 978, which is specifically listed as Sahih, says that stoning was for adultery was ordained by Muhammad. And so you can't really say, even though you were discussing in your earlier video, Surah 24.2, where it's 100 lashes for adultery, you can't really say that if it's ordained by Muhammad, practiced by Muhammad, you have that other hadith where Umar says that it was in the Quran and dropped yeah. out. Yeah. And uh, you can say, well, there's the 100 lashes, but it doesn't. the Quran doesn't say, but not stoning. And so it's not really a disagreement yeah. that you could you can say these contradict the Quran and therefore they must be discarded. So he has to allow for stoning. He has to allow, as you noted before, for amputation for theft because that's in the Quran in five thirty eight. Quran, you're right. He has to allow for child marriage because that's Aisha, uh, and that's multiply attested in numerous Sahih ahadith in yeah. Bukhari yeah. in Muslim, and so you can't get rid of that. And, of course, the other elephant in the room, among many, actually, that we could discuss, is the fact that the Quran so many times, I have here a list, uh, but it's, it would be tedious to read them all off, but there are at least 20 verses in which the Quran says, obey Allah and the Messenger. How are you going to obey the Messenger when exactly. there's virtually nothing about him in the Quran itself? Yeah. That's why the Hadith exists. And yeah. so you can't even obey the Quran without the Hadith. And this is why the idea of Quran-only Muslims has always been a small minority. It's a relatively new phenomenon. Most of the time, for most of Islamic history, it was considered to be an incoherent, unworkable idea that contradicted the Quran itself. Let's unpack that a little bit more, because my good friend Shabir Ali is a Quran-only. I think the new term that they call it is now Quranist. 
That's the new term they like to use. They are Quranists, uh, which I, I'm sitting there and just I love this, that they have now come back to the Quran only. Uh, I, I, I know that some people have spent their whole time on the Hadith and try to confront it. I find that the Quran is one of the best and easiest books to confront because it is so simple. It is easy to read and it is open to all kinds of interpretation. But what the part that is not open to interpretation is so damning. Yes. No doubt about that. No Muslim can walk away from the Quran. As you can see, Salman bin, uh, I mean, Muhammad bin Salman cannot walk away from the Quran. That's why it is his constitution, and that's why it is his redress. Now, help, help me here. F from your perspective, Quran only, have you have you ever engaged with people who are Quran only or Quranists? Yeah. Yes, it's years ago, but yes. Okay. What has been just from your, your experience? What has been your what has been that experience when you engage with them? Well, they they uh, I actually said to them the same thing I said to you, uh, noting all these verses saying obey the messenger and asking them how they would do that. And then characteristically, as I'm sure you've had experience with in hundreds of instances, they didn't answer the question, but rather changed the subject and went on to expatiate at length about how. Quran, uh, it's always been Islamic jurisprudence, which is absolutely true, that if Hadith contradict Quran, they're to be thrown out. And so the Quran is the ultimate authority. And uh, then went on to say that the Quran, that the uh, the formulators of the, the collectors of the Hadith threw out numerous uh, stories that they considered to be inaccurate. And thus, it was just a matter of prudence to be a Quranist and... It was uh, guarding against the sullying of the purity of the religion and so on. But they never addressed that central point. And can you see, Robert, what we are doing? And this is what something that I have seen over the last 20 to 30 years. We're pushing them back into a corner little bit by little. Have you noticed this? Oh, yeah. You know something uh, I think that is very important in this regard that uh, one of your commenters pointed out. Uh, and I don't mean to skip ahead here, but this is a very important point about being pushed into a corner that infidels know what's in the Islamic texts now. And that was not true uh, right after 9-11 when there was so much interest in those Islamic texts. And so, for example, right after 9-11, there was a very useful online database called the USC MSA something or other. It was University of Southern California Muslim Students Association, and they had a, a searchable Quran, and I believe they may have had Hadith that were searchable as well, but I, I don't remember now. It's been so long, but I made great use of that and wrote a great deal with embedded links uh, online using that database, and I think I'm ultimately responsible for its, its demise, <laughs> not intentionally, but because they saw that not just not just me, but others also were were making so much use of this thing that it was hurting them more than helping them. And ultimately, it was remodeled in a way that made it completely useless. And I was reminded of that the other day when I went back to Quran.com, where it's a very it's a, it used to be a marvelously helpful site where you could search for any Quran verse and get a number of translations, get the original Arabic, get a transliteration. And now recently, luckily right after I finished uh, my the book that'll be out at the end of this year, The Critical Quran, uh, right after I, I finished it, I went back to the Quran.com the last few days and I see that they've completely overhauled that. So that now if you search for, for example, uh, I was searching for Surah 39 verse eight, and you don't get, you get anything but. You put in 39.8 and you get anything but 39.8. And then you, when you go to 39.8, you don't get the, the passage itself. You get other, other things. And I see, oh, now they have made this useless for the infidels. And what will be next? But the cat is out of the bag. Also 20 years ago, I remember I was on a TV, on a radio show rather with, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, Hussein Ibish. Do you know Hussein Ibish? No. He, he's kind of faded from the scene, but he was, uh, he was a very, very popular uh, analyst right after 9-11 and before that as well for uh, uh, political stories involving political Islam, the Palestinians, and so on. And I was, I was on a show with Hussein Ibish 
in this was must have been in 2001 or maybe two. And I said, you know, the the you, you're going to have to address Islamic anti-Semitism at some point. And the fact that the Quran says that the disobedient Jews were transformed into apes and pigs. And he says, that's not in the Quran. <laughs> and I was kind of dumbfounded and I was also ready for him at that time. Uh, but I was not ready for what came next. He, he, I gave him the verses, chapter 2, 63 to 65, chapter 5, 59 to 60, and chapter 7, 166. And he said, nope, it's not in the Quran. You're, you're, you're misinterpreting it. And he actually went away and wrote an article in which he quoted chapter 5, verse 60, but not 59. So as to give the impression that there were people who were transformed into apes and pigs, but they weren't the Jews because he left out the salient portion of the passage. Now, he could get away with that in those days. And yeah. people went away thinking, I'm sure, that uh, he's Spencer, he's not Muslim, and Hussein Ibish is Muslim, Hussein Ibish must be right. But now I think uh, too many people know what's in, what's in the Islamic texts. And this is why MBS has to confront them in some way or another if he's going to move Saudi Arabia into the 21st century. What I'd like to do, uh, Robert, since you brought it up, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on, I, I want to really respond to some of the comments of the of the, uh, of the video that I put up there on MBS. Uh, there have been about a twenty over 20,000 people have watched that video in the last two days. But what was fascinating are the comments. I love to read the comments. And for those of you who are right comments, especially when you are unpacking it, when you're uh, really... Uh, wrestling with it, I will use it and I will come up and we will uh, respond to it. So I want to read these comments and I want you to listen to them and then I want you to respond. You, In some ways you've already spawned, responded to the first one, but let me read it. It's from Bart Con Connolly. Bart Connolly has been on for many uh, months, years in fact. I, I don't, I've never met him, but I l always love his comments. And this is what he says. Islamic scholars have always rated Isnad above content. Even if you get into unbroken multiple chains and throw out the rest, you are still left with the issue of content. What will they do with the ones left, uh, uh, the ones left and the Quranic verses supporting such things as child sex, that's when you referred to with Aisha and Muhammad, execution, uh, um, and there's the whole litany of those, chapter 47, verse 4, chapter 8, verse 39, uh, and on and on and on, so many. Uh, execution, again, the same thing, I'm sorry, uh, killing homosexuals, uh, some would go to chapter, which one would you go to on homosexuals? Because I don't know where I would go to for killing homosexuals. That I don't find in the Quran. Yeah, I go to the Hadith for that. And the yep. Hadith where it says uh, the, if you find people committing the sin of Lot, then uh, uh, execute them both. Yeah. But there's not really, uh, I can't think of clear Quran about it. I wouldn't know there is, if you have two one. women committing lewdness, then close them up in their houses forever. But that's uh, that's about as close as you can get. Let's go on. Right. He says that beating women, that would be 434. Uh, in addition to yeah. moral problems, uh, such as, and rational problems with chronic verses and bringing Arabia into the modern world. Uh, what is he going to do with shooting stars at Jinn? I mean, that's a good one. That's an easy one to yeah. go. The world being on a whale and the splitting of the moon, chapter 54, verse 1. Sleeping in caves for hundreds of years, that's uh, chapter... Uh, eight, uh, that's chapter neither 18 or 19. And of course, the mile high wall top, that's with dual cut nine out of chapter 18 with metal. So these are real problems. Let me I'm throw it back in your lap. This is a good question that Bart's going to come up with. Now, you kind of already answered it. And that is, if you put the Quran and the tradition side by side, aren't they both problematic? Very much so. I mean, another one we could mention is also out of chapter 18, which is the most wonderful chapter, really. It's got so many uh, interesting, entertaining things. Uh, but uh, it's got the sun setting in the muddy pool and yep. Dual Karnain traveling to the end of the world to see the sun setting there. And so what if the what if MBS wants to have a space program uh, and the constitution of his uh, <laughs> the constitution of his state is the Quran that says the world is flat? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is going to the, the the problems are endless and can be we could we could go on for hours about the absurdities this is going to come into the moon but following you know, the sun and the sun then following the moon uh, which is which you see in the Quran I mean there there's right. there's such a litany of what and but I mean some of the other things and this is what Bart's coming up with and I like it it it, it supports what you're saying whereas maybe a 
100, maybe 20, even maybe 10 years ago, most Westerners did not, had not really read the Quran, had not really gone to the traditions. We didn't really know what they were saying. And most Muslims could pretty much say anything about the Quran, and they knew we wouldn't be able to come back on them. But people like you, Robert, and I give you full credit for it because you kind of paved the way for the rest of us with all the books you put out and all the material. And no, I, I really appreciate what you've done. You have really pushed back the barriers on critical analysis of the Quran and critical analysis of Muhammad, something that no one wanted to touch, and also critical analysis of the morale, the moral specter and the relevancy of Islam in the 20th century, the 21st century now. But we have come leaps and bounds because of that. Remember, Yasser Qadi made this statement in his infamous interview of June 8th last year, where he says, you know, the Westerners have come leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. I would say not just the last hundred years, in the last 10 years, primarily yes. because of the books you've put out, because you have really, uh, you have educated the West. You have educated us to understand not only what Islam is saying, finally, but also where their sources are and that we need to go back to their source, which is what he is doing in this interview. He is trying to go back with us to the source. I don't think he's ever read it. I, I think he memorized it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, he's an Arabic speaker, but classical Arabic is not modern standard Arabic. And it may be also that when, when, you know, when you're memorizing something at a very young age, you're not engaging with it intellectually. And I'm sure that there are many passages, if not the whole thing, that he's never really sat down and pondered in an intellectual manner or thought about their implication. I would imagine being a, a Saudi prince, he has been a, had a very sheltered lifestyle. He's been very, very careful where he's been educated. He made a very big thing about the fact that he was educated in Saudi Arabia and he didn't go overseas. I thought that was fascinating. But nonetheless, yeah, he doesn't have an influence. See, he's <laughs> not tainted by this is not his reform movement is not coming from being uh, 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 corrupted by the West. It's coming from pure Saudi Islamic principle. Now, here's what's fascinating, because he, he, if if this is the case, I, I, it's obvious to me that he is not aware of just the passages we brought up. I mean, we just did this off the top of our head. What you brought up and what Bart Connolly is bringing up here, the he is not aware of these problems. So he's certainly not done a critical analysis. I don't think he's ever had anybody confront him on the Quran. I think he really does believe that the Quran can pass every muster, can pass every critical analysis, can pass, is probably the most relevant book for today. Are you getting that idea? Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, this is the kind of thing that you're taught in Islamic societies, as, as you well know, from birth, that this is the most extraordinary book, this is the most extraordinary man, and everything they do is, uh, everything the book teaches, you should do, everything the man does, you should emulate. And so, uh, I'm sure that he simply assumes that if Saudi Arabia is based thoroughly on the Quran, then it will zoom ahead of the rest of the world. That will take care of all the problems right there. But in one fell swoop. No, it's kind of like the passages in chapter 8 of the Quran, Surah Al Anfal, the spoils of war, about the Battle of Badr and how they won because Allah fought for them. Yeah. And so the corollary then coming after the Battle of Uhud and other passages in chapter 3 and elsewhere that uh, they lost because they weren't pleasing Allah. And so it's a one-to-one -one correlation. The more you obey Allah, the more you will succeed in this world, not, not just in the next. And so the idea, the Christian idea of the wicked prospering, why do the wicked prosper? Uh, uh, why would the, the Messiah be crucified and so on? These things don't exist in Islam. In Islam, if you obey Allah, then you will do well in this world. So he's he's actually just betraying the mindset of the uh, the most pious Muslim in that that you want to get ahead in the world, then you redouble your efforts to uh, engage Islamic piety, and then you will you will you will do well in this world. One last question on this thing before we go to the next one. Um... What do you do with the fact that many of those he's imprisoned or his father has imprisoned are the very people who have said the same thing he's now saying? So this is another thing that he's going to get in trouble for. Just like I, I, I was suggesting earlier that he's following Shiite ideas of Ijtihad. Uh, this is, uh, I say that, by the way, let me uh, make that clear that it's, 
it's a Shiite. It's it's more likely that they will call him a Shiite than a follower of Muhammad Abdu because of the tensions with Iran today, and the uh, the the sharpness that they have brought. Those tensions have brought to the Sunni Shiite divide, and so it's an easy way to tar him, to to call him something like that. But uh, in any case, yes, he's 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 imprisoned people who are saying exactly the same thing. His enemies can very easily bring this up. I'm sure they will. And I wouldn't be in the least surprised if he falls from power in the next few years. On the other hand, as we have also already said, he's obviously very canny and intelligent, and he may figure out a way to overcome all this. Well, I think if he doesn't really care, if he can prove and get his country into the 21st century and make it one of the, uh, make it the magnet for the whole world in these very areas that he is saying, then he doesn't really care what the people say because he'll have so much, he'll have so much profit on his hand and he'll be able to say, but look what I've done. Look what I've done in almost every area, technologically, educationally, uh, socially, and all the rest. So possibly yes. that's what he's thinking of. And he realizes, he realizes that the writing is on the wall. If you are going to be held res to respect, especially in the 21st century, especially in the Western mind, you're going to have to do deal with some of these, these 7th century outlandish rules, laws, and institutions that he thinks only exist in the Hadith without realizing they're just as bad or even worse in the Quran. Let's go to the next one, which is Yaqub Ismail. He says, time for another yeah. canonization of the Quran, the sixth Quran, and the final one by editing and clearing all the verses that were added after the first century of Hijra. <laughs> Are you feeling me? Are you familiar well, with the five canonizations of Yasmin? We'll see yeah. you all again once we have another problem to unpack. Shadi Nasser. I'm not sure. Are you talking? Is that that various formula, various permutations of the various Kira'at? Yeah, what, no, what he has done, and it, it is that, but it's more than that. What uh, Shadi Nasser has done, and this is be, this is now becoming quite popular around the world, when you, he come out and he said there are five canons of the Quran, very five diff, distinct canonization. The first one you would know is the 652 one. Uh, that would be, uh, of, of course, Uthman's ca canon, where he takes... Yeah, that, one's, that one's a fable, but okay. Okay, that's the fable, and that's why he's not ri written a book on that one, because there's nothing to write yes. on. He's very clear. I just have nothing to write on for that one. And here's a Harvard right. professor. You know, he got his PhD at Harvard making that admission. The second one would be Ibn Mujahid, with, which is the 936 canon. That's the seven, yeah. the seven readers, the Gira'ats. And then the third okay. one would be um, uh, Shatabis, Al Shatabis uh, uh, Quran, which would be 1194, which is the 12th this century. Where the, that's the 14 that are added to the seven. Two, oh. Yeah, I know the 14. Okay. And that's, that's Al-Shatabi, who did that in 1194. So that's the okay. 12th century. And then you have um, Al-Jazidi. Al-Jazidi, who in 1429 then uh, adds another uh, 3 plus 6, which is 9, another 9. So it would be okay. 7, then 14, then 9. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4. And then the fifth canon would be the, our good man, Muhammad al Husseini al Haddad, who then did the 1924 canon there in Al Azhar University, the one, the Hafs Quran, this one that I have in my hand right here. So that's five. And those are the recognized five canons. What he's saying in his ear looks like we're going to get a sixth one. And this, this will be, be. That's an interesting idea, but what would, it, what would it do? I'm not sure what it would accomplish. I mean, it would be interesting if MBS were to produce a Quran that actually endeavored to get rid of the problematic passages. But what would you have then? Five mimeographed sheets? Uh, it, it, <laughs> you wouldn't have very much left. It probably would only be about five sheets that would be legitimate yes. or that would be that would be relevant for today. And you're right, that is a real problem. And I can see the dilemma for any Muslim, not just MBS, for any Muslim, one of the problem, one of the greatest things about all of our discussions is all we need to do is open its pages and read it. Once you yes. read it, Look how irrelevant it is. Look how impractical it is and how it does not belong in the 21st century. Unlike the Bible, when you look at the... I mean, you know, uh, I, w uh, giving talks around the country over the years, I have several times challenged when I have questioners saying, well, you know, you're, you're not quoting all the passages about peace and brotherhood and tolerance. And I would open the book and say, find one, point, up, point <laughs> one out to me. And here, let's play another game too. Point to open it to any page, and if it does not, if that page does not have 
a furious castigation of unbelievers, then I'll give you a hundred dollars. Oh, of course, I nobody have found there. There is no such page. Every page of the Quran has some kind of castigation of unbelievers. Okay. And so, if you're going to open up Saudi Arabia to the world and make non-Muslims able to live, yeah, you can. <laughs> You're going to have very little left. You're going to have very little left. That's a great way to end this talk. I th thanks so much, Robert. Really, I wanted to unpack, get your mind. As uh, one, one last thought, looking at MBS, with his power, with his prestige, what he comes to the table with, he brings in an awful lot of clout and an awful lot of responsibility. Muslims will say, well, we, we just dismiss him as nothing more than a political prince I mean, I'm getting this even from the comments. How would you respond to that? Is Should we pay attention to MBS, or is he nothing more than riffraff that is not going to make much of an impact in the world to come or in the days to come? Saudi Arabia is very important. The, the, it's the kingdom of the two holy places. And as the custodians of the, the holy mosque of the prophet, it has a status in the Islamic world that no other country has. And so... It also styles itself as being the quintessential application of Islam in society. Yeah. So what he's saying has extraordinary resonance. If he manages to pull this off, which I do not believe he's going to be able to do, but if he were somehow to manage to pull it off, it would have incredible resonance all around the Islamic world and may end up leading to what everybody actually wants and everybody thinks it's going to be easy and thinks that it's already starting with a, with a handful of self-proclaimed moderate Muslims in the United States, Islamic yeah. reform. Uh, Islamic reform is, is one of the most difficult things to accomplish in the world. In my book, The History of Jihad, I show that the Islam is full of reformers. And there have been reformations in Islam throughout Islamic history. And every one of them has made it uglier and more violent than it was already, because that's what's in the core texts. And so you want reform in Islam, you're going to be uh, sorry for what you wished for if you get it, because it's just going to make things worse. But of course, in America, there's, there's so much ignorance about all this that people think, oh, what we need is Islamic reform. And look, here's a moderate Muslim spokesman on television, and he's saying all the right things. Uh, everything is going to be OK, because most Muslims think the way he do does. And they don't understand the Quran says, this day I have perfected your religion for you. Chapter 5, verse 3. How are you going to reform what's perfect? Mm -hmm. And why is it that once you, when, when you get a reformer who's sincere, then suddenly he's getting death threats? And the government of Sudan executed Mahmoud Mohammed Taha in 1985 for heresy, for saying that the Meccan passages should take precedence over the Medinan ones because the Meccans were less violent. Uh, this all militates against the reform. But if MBS is able to do something here, and like I said, I, I don't think he's going to do it. But if he were to manage somehow to do it in a way that's beyond me, which would then he could end up actually forming some kind of new understanding of Islam itself that could make a massive geopolitical difference. Robert, I love the, and this is a great way to end off. What you're saying and what people are asking for is people are realizing, and in fact, this is even what uh, what the the the, the, uh, the Mr. Mudaifa was asking, we do want to see an acceptable face. We do want to see a, a Saudi Arabia that is respected by the whole world. But we've got a problem. We have got the Wahhabi movement. We have got these extremists. How best can we get back to this acceptable face? His answer was this book. This is the reformation he wants to come back to. And in some ways, isn't that exactly what Martin Luther demanded? Didn't he say sola scriptura? Yeah. Wasn't that the whole premise of the Reformation movement for us as Christians? We came back to this book, and by coming back to this book, we actually got back on track again, right? But that's a permutation of the same argument as people have often said. I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard it a million times that uh, Christianity is 600 years older than Islam, and so in 600 years, all this will be ironed out. And I, I'm always amazed by people who say that. I think you must not know anything about Christianity or Islam. Yeah. Luther was able to establish the, uh, uh, the, the, pro the whole Protestant tradition because the Christian scriptures have a basis for a religion that is humane and tolerant and, and loving and, and, and 
beneficent and so on. You and go back to the Quran okay. only and you get violence and, 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 and hatred and contempt for unbelievers and so on. And so you're going to have a Quran, a back to the Quran reformation, you're going to have lots of trouble. Basically, it comes back down to these two books, doesn't it? He would like to get everybody to come back to this book. He wants to eradicate Wahhabism without realizing what do you think Wahhabism is? It is this book. It is a yes. strict reading of this book, word by word, verse That's by verse, Wahhab application. People would ask Wahhab, you know, what are his thoughts? And he, he what, what can you give us a, a treatise? And he, he, he only has very brief writings that survive. Because he said, just read the Quran. This is all this is about. And so the, the problem is the fundamental difference between those two books that most people don't want to recognize. And this is one reason why when Martin Luther was asked, what, what is it that they're to do? He kept on saying, just the Bible. Sola Scriptura. Only go back to Scripture. This book is relevant. This book is relevant for every day, for everyone, for you and me, for anyone. And that's why it's so good to be able to do a comparison and see what MBS wants is what really what a lot of people would like. But you better not go back to this book. You've got the wrong book. This is just as bad as yeah. the Hadith. But come on back to the real book. Come back back to the better book. Come yeah, on you back. You know, in that the days of sense. Martin Luther, the prince would determine the religion for the region. And MBS would do his people a much greater favor if he said, okay, we're going to be Christians now and <laughs> pattern the society after the Bible. And, uh -huh. you know, there are a number of abundant precedents in history for that kind of proclamation. And it's likely that that wouldn't endanger his life any more than what he's trying to do is going to endanger it. That's true. That's true. From your lips to God's ears. Listen, thanks so much, Robert. This has been terrific having you on board. It's always inspiring to listen to. You have really paved the way for so many of us. And basically, I would say an awful lot of credit has to be given to you and others like you who have come on before and really opened the way so that we are 100 years better, so we are uh, much more knowledgeable, so we can actually read the text and throw it right back and say, you've got an irrelevant text. Uh, so thank you for all you have done. Thank you for all that you're going to continue to do. And thank you for coming on board here on Fander Films. God bless you. And we'll see you all again once we have another problem to unpack. Mm -hmm.